speaker will be Dr. William Wong, Senior Counsel of the Woho Chambers. Dr. Wong has been in practicing in Hong Kong since 1998. Uh, in 2013, Dr. Wong was appointed as a Senior Counsel in Hong Kong. He's also presently and long executive director of the Security and Future Committee of Hong Kong. Uh, his topic uh, of the presentation is the role of Asian culture in international commercial arbitration. Uh, Dr. Wong, uh, turn it to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lloyd, and thank you for attending uh, today's seminar. Um, I would like to share with the audience uh, from my experience uh, how uh, international commercial arbitrations uh, were being conducted, and in particular, uh, the role of um, Asian culture and an understanding of the Asian culture would have an impact to the result of an international commercial, whether construction or otherwise, arbitration. Now, uh, let me directly give you an example. Uh, any law, any legal dispute uh, arises out of context, right? And therefore, in the common law system, uh, in which Hong Kong is part of the common law world, uh, the law or the regulations comes out from the custom, right? So common law's uh, predecessor is the custom, customary law of a particular location. Right. Uh, so customs law and also the way people think, the way people react to matters are very important. Uh, the reason why I mentioned this is because uh, it would have an impact on the choose the choice of arbitrators and also the way how a case is being conducted so as to achieve a fair and just outcome. Uh, this is particularly important in the context of international commercial arbitration simply because uh, the uh, route to an appeal against an arbitration award is very limited. Uh, not even an error of law would ipso facto by itself uh, gives you uh, a, a, a chance to overturn the award. And given the importance and the finality given to an award, it's very important that uh, we get it right, we have a fair and just result. Now, when we were talking about culture, I can directly give you an example. Uh, in the Asian context, uh, both in arbitration involving um, mainland parties, uh, and I have conducted a case involving Indonesian parties, um, and also a case involving uh, Thailand companies. It's very often that uh, the chairman or the boss of the um, parties uh, could have reached uh, certain oral agreements, right, or certain understandings, uh, which were not reduced it into writing, right, in a very uh, uh, sophisticated or complex contractual document, right. Now, uh, whereas in the uh, Anglo-Saxon Western context, if you say that, well, I have reached an important decision uh, or important agreement with my counterparty, more often than not, the content of that agreement will be reduced into writing, it will be documented, and you'll have the involvement of leading law firms, uh, and you will come up with executed copies of agreements, supplemental agreements, second supplemental agreements, etc. Right. So everything is nicely documented, right? But in contrast, in an Asian context, sometimes having signed an agreement and the commercial parties, they are deal makers, right? Uh, and the role of lawyers, in-house lawyers, uh, even in the very large companies in the Asian context, uh, they do not have the commensurate influence uh, over the uh, execution of contractual documents uh, as in the Western uh, context. And therefore, an understanding of the importance and also 
the uh, uh, credibility, you may say so, of the existence of an oral agreement um, is very important, right? Uh, if you're wearing a hat or if you are being educated uh, in the Western context, culture, then you are thinking of things not being reduced in writing, so important thing was reached at a coffee shop. Uh, you may think that that is utterly unbelievable, right? And they would so sort of color out the way you look at a commercial dispute, right? So uh, the importance or the credibility of all agreements, particularly you have reached a set of template or agreements subsequently, uh, the parties might have agreed something else uh, which varied the um, uh, uh, or change the context or terms of the, of the agreement. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you can only deduce uh, such an agreement by looking at the conduct of the parties, by looking at the subsequent uh, email exchanges, uh, WeChat messages or WhatsApp messages or any electronic form of record. So uh, and that is the, uh, uh, the first matter, right? Uh, the second matter is uh, culture goes to, first of all, your lifestyle, whether you drink tea or you drink coffee, uh, also games you played uh, in your leisure time, uh, music, painting, uh, cultural, um, popular culture, films, TV, uh, and also more importantly, um, your ideas, your philosophy. Uh, of approaching matters, right? So you can see that when, and that will brings into my second um, point, is that when assessing uh, credibility or the nature of a case, right? Uh, in the Asian context, there is this important relationship between uh, a superior and a subordinate, right? Uh, more often than not, the boss, quote unquote, the boss or the superior, right? Uh, first of all, they might not be uh, particularly forthcoming or willing to give evidence or testimony in an arbitration. And secondly, their command of the dispute, their understanding of the uh, niceties and the complexity of a dispute uh, might not be great, right? And normally they delegate to the uh, junior or subordinates, right? Uh, and the subordinates' communication with the senior or the boss might not be as effective as it should be, right? And therefore, when um, the boss or when the person in charge uh, was asked to give evidence or to uh, render witness statements uh, or um, affirmations, whatever documents to a tribunal, right? Uh, more, most likely and more often than not, uh, the document was drafted by lawyers and then uh, using very loyally languages uh, without the deponent actually having fully understand uh, the context of the case. And therefore when being confronted uh, in cross-examination, which is something which is not very familiar, uh, uh, under an Asian context, right? Uh, because in Asian context, it's always talking about harmony, talks about cooperation, right? Uh, it is the last resort that party turned adversarial to each other, right? And um, we're not used it, uh, in fact, to a very antagonistic environment where you have to defend every proposition, you have to defend everything you say, Right, and you cannot use loose language, you have to use very precise language, uh, and that's also part of the culture as well. Uh, so, uh, when a party is being cross examined or being a uh, story or his version of facts is subject to tests uh, by cross examination, uh, and if the statement does not come from him or her, then it's very easy from my experience that the evidence might not be believed. It if were to apply an Anglo-Saxon Western standard, which means that although he or she is telling the facts, right, and, and I sense that from most of the arbitration where a party lose, because they cannot articulate 
on the kind of applicant good enough to affect your case. And the reason why is that A, they did not tell the story in their own language or in their own frame of mind, but you have, instead you have lawyers who do it for them and charge a fee, and they just sign a signature to the document, having read the document and understand what was being said. So when being cross-examined to say that, well, this is, isn't this is what happened? The answer is yes. And then Mr. X or Miss, Miss X, let's go back to your witness statement. Let's go paragraph X, all right? It doesn't exactly say what you just said, all right? Now, more than, than not, if we are wearing a uh, Western context that will be a lie, that will be incredible because what you said in one statement is inconsistent uh, with what you set out uh, in uh, oral form uh, during your testimony, all right? But in fact, if you are a bit more patient, you will ask the witness to explore why was there is this inconsistency or apparent inconsistency. More often than not, they would be able to give an answer. Right? It's just that that answer is not the answer that was given to the clients, uh, to the clients own lawyers. It comes back to the point that uh, one needs to be very, very meticulous when taking instructions and when writing up witness statements for Asian clients, right? Because sometimes they don't know what's important and, and you just have to prompt uh, into the depth of the dispute. So much so that uh, they can bring out the real issues, right? And say that in a coherent and chronological order uh, so that they're telling the truth, right? The facts may not be perfect in the sense that you have a story which explains everything, right? But sometimes you do not need a perfect story. You need a true story, right? With deficiencies, uh, which is actually more understandable than having someone who's completely perfect, who hasn't committed any error or mistake in any communication or any work, right? So that's the, that is the, the second element in terms of how evidence are being prepared uh, in terms of oral testimony in court. Now, the third element um, that I'd like to uh, share with you is in terms of the preservation of evidence. Uh, for example, uh, in construction or in uh, investment in equity finance, or for example, you invest in private equity in a project, whether in mainland China, in Indonesia, or in Thailand. Right now, uh, there may be some disputes arise as a result of some performance, uh, which either on the payment side or on the delivery side, uh, which is not entirely satisfactory according to terms of contract. Right now, in the normal context, then you should document uh, what you are complaining and the other side's, the other side's explanation. Uh, and all these correspondence uh, will become relevant, right? Because it's more often than not that one says, oh, wow, uh, you now complain about this uh, particular aspect of the case, all right? But when the matter uh, arose, uh, you haven't mentioned this, all right? So this is an afterthought, this is a concoction uh, or a new invention of a defense. And therefore that watered up, waters down uh, the credibility or the genuineness of the complaint. Right? And in the Asian context, that is, uh, again, some um, elements to into account to the fact that Asians do not have the habit of writing long letters and, uh, and many letters, right? So uh, you may say that, well, I took up a call, I took up a phone and I complain about this, but at the office, there's no record. You don't have any documentary record that you don't write long emails. Um, like uh, we lawyers, we charge by the minutes, um, by the hour, by how many letters you write, how many legal documents you generate, right? Now that is still not um, uh, a deep rooted culture here, right? Uh, businessmen, deal makers want to make business happen. They want to resolve problems, right? Uh, they're not the habit of generating, creating evidence. Uh, in preparation, just in case uh, there will be a court case uh, in due course uh, in um, either the uh, court proceedings or in an arbitration. 
Uh, so you can see that the um, uh, differences uh, in approach in terms of the culture, uh, just give you three examples, uh, are, are very different. Uh, uh, now, from that perspective, uh, of course, there are many, many other aspects, uh, including uh, the way how arguments are presented and also uh, the way uh, how one picks arbitrators. Uh, uh, this is the uh, second layer which I'm coming to. Uh, in terms of um, a case, uh, at any material time, uh, it is very important that there are two elements of it. Is that A, you want to get a just result, a correct result. In other words, uh, you want your case to be fully ventilated before a tribunal or a court, right? Now, and therefore the education, the approach, uh, the um, specialties of arbitrators, in my view and in my experience is of the paramount importance in any case, right? Now in uh, high court in Hong Kong or in any court jurisdictions, uh, parties do not have the luxury or choice to pick its own judges, right? So it's by random and you go to a listing club and he or she will give you a judge, right? Even in that context, one needs to go to the history of the judges, look at his past judgments, right? To see whether the particular judge or the particular um, uh, panel uh, will focus more on what we call the broad merits of the case, or some will be more technical, right? On the uh, legal aspects, right? So different judges have a slightly different approach, right? Uh, this does, does not mean that the result is arbitrary or haphazard. It's just that uh, you have to know your audience, right? Uh, so it is very important that when choosing a judge, right, or what advance your argument, right, you have to know your judge, right? Now, you impose that, you superimpose that into international commercial arbitration, which means that you have to understand the nature of your dispute, right? Having understand the nature of your dispute, then you have to be very careful uh, in picking up, in picking up uh, or in choosing uh, the right arbitrators, right? When I say the right arbitrators, I do not mean that you choose an arbitrator that's going to allow you to win a case, but if you choose uh, an arbitrator that would allow you to fully present, to fully ventilate your case, he or she would have an understanding uh, and a mind which is open rather than shut, right? Sometimes if you pick someone who is far too smart, you will say, that, okay, I've read this set of papers. I know the answer to this, right? And he or she would then shut his mind without listening or, or pretend to listen to the case. But in fact, what you want is to have someone who of course is smart, intelligent, but who is also willing to listen, right? Uh, sometimes one changes his mind when an idea or a perspective uh, strikes you to say, ah, maybe something is missing or maybe uh, the real perspective of looking at the matter is this, right? So uh, you have to be very careful in picking up, uh, in choosing arbitrators, right? And <laughs> it is here again, the uh, Asian culture comes into play, right? Now, Asians like big names, right? Um, uh, famous names, uh, uh, better carry with uh, him or her a few titles, all right? Uh, now, uh, that is both a plus or minus. I do not mean to say that uh, a title or, or uh, a prestige uh, is not important because to a certain extent it reflects the quality of that individual, right? But you do not pick an arbitrator in the Asian context because, wow, this is the chairman or the, um, the president of this association or that association, things like that, right? In fact, jokingly, uh, the reason 
<laughs> that someone has the time to serve as a chairman or president of a certain association uh, may, be, may mean that either uh, he is very publicly spirited. Alternatively, it may be means that uh, <laughs> he is not uh, uh, fully engaged in the work uh, that he should be working on, which is specialized in the particular area of the work. So in the Asian context, uh, sometimes one just go for uh, the arbitrator with big names. And more often than not, uh, that would result in uh, a situation where the client would not like to face because a, either he or she is too busy, uh, they are what you have to wait for many months or even years before you can get an award. So uh, I don't think there is anything more important than choosing the right arbitrator who can understand your case, right? And uh, that's very important, right? Now, the, the second issue is this, right? Uh, as I said, some are more technical, some are more merit, merit based, broad merit basis. But what is important is this, for arbitrator, uh, you need other than the elements what I mentioned, you need two other elements. One is he has to be intelligent, right? Uh, you don't want someone who's dumb, right? But by far the most important quality is integrity, right? Now, uh, in the Asian culture, you don't want a situation uh, where uh, you think that you can call up an arbitrator, uh, have a discussion with him or her about the progress of the case uh, privately uh, without informing the other side, right? Or uh, you don't want an arbitrator who once appointed uh, at your client's recommendation, then will try his very best uh, to assist your client's case, almost acting as your client's advocate. Uh, during an, in, an intentional arbitration, right? Now, that sometimes, from my experience, will backfire, right? Because, uh, first of all, it's not legally and morally correct, but in terms of efficiency, in terms of the real result, right? Uh, it may backfire in the sense that if it is a tribunal of three, right? Now, I have been presiding on quite a number of uh, international commercial arbitrations. If I sense that, well, my co-arbitrator, wingman appointed by, for example, a claimant, um, is always advocating, acting for his client, almost like an additional lawyer, right? Then the presiding arbitrator's will will be, for example, in my case, I would say that, okay, I respect his will as an additional lawyer for the team. It only means that I cannot rely on his views when I come to writing an award. All right, so it's just that, well, it becomes uh, a one-man job uh, in the arbitration uh, tribunal, right? So the ideal candidate that you want is that someone who is intelligent, who has integrity, want to achieve the result, but who has an open mind, who understand your culture, and who will be willing to listen uh, to the party's submission and will be able to deliver the award as efficiently and as quickly as possible, right? So those are the qualities that you want. Uh, I've seen so many um, clients who decided to approach X and Y as our trader because the president, chairman, or he carries this or that title. At the end of the day, the result is not entirely desirable or satisfactory due to a basket of reasons. Therefore, uh, you need to understand the judge and you need to understand the arbitrators. All right. Now, this brings me back to uh, a suggestion, a proposal uh, that I'd like uh, to share with you all. In international commercial arbitration, particularly in this area of the region, right? Uh, if you're a party, one problem that you face is, well, I don't know which arbitrator is good, which arbitrator is not good, right? Uh, or because arbitration awards are not published, therefore, I really don't know um, uh, what is his um, uh, style, et cetera, right? Hence, uh, I think uh, it is very important that there be more transparency, right? 
In other words, uh, with the increase in um, communications, uh, with the increase also in business between Hong Kong, the ASEAN uh, countries uh, in the coming uh, decade or decades to come, right? This is an area in Asia where you have of the world's population and is growing, right? Uh, and therefore, it's very important that uh, we have more discussions, more communications, uh, more forums, right? So that uh, parties will get to know more about the petitioner in this area. Otherwise, it's almost like in a black box, right? Uh, you don't know who is good, who is no good. Uh, and you don't know, not just arbitrators, you don't know who are the good counsel, good lawyers for arbitration. And our teams of lawyers in this region also need to uh, uh, equip themselves so that they can compete on equal footing or even doing better uh, if, we're, if we're having an arbitration with, let's say, the Anglo-Saxon companies with the Western world. Uh, we can do it with dignity, we can do it with the same efficiency, the same courtesy, uh, and with the same result, and we'll earn the respect that we do to us. Now, that, uh, uh, that is a big project. In other words, uh, we need to have a few organizations, uh, and, and the one that I have in mind from a Hong Kong perspective would be the HKIAC, which Eric just uh, have a speech and almost like an advertisement for Hong Kong. But there are also other regional centers in Hong Kong, for example, the one in KL, the one in Singapore, um, and also the other Asian um, uh, countries, uh, arbitration uh, institutes, right? Uh, I don't think that there should be more uh, communications, uh, more seminars uh, with the COVID. Uh, webinars like this will be very useful, very helpful, uh, so that you can identify and know uh, more about how we had uh, set up or develop a platform for dispute resolution uh, in this area of the uh, uh, world, uh, paying attention to our unique culture and environment here. Now, uh, so that's the institutional exchange, transparency information, right? Now, uh, one more ambitious point, uh, which I would like to uh, follow up for discussion, is that in view of the um, uh, unique culture and unique environment here in Hong, in this region of the world, uh, Hong Kong included, uh, an idea that one may explore uh, is whether we can, uh, through the cooperation of um, our e LCEP or a similar um, uh, arrangement that various institutions uh, can discuss uh, like the institutional model law, uh, a uniformed or unified uh, commercial code uh, in this area, right? Uh, because you apply Hong Kong law, you apply uh, Singaporean law, you apply uh, Indonesian law, et cetera, right? Now that would increase, um, of course, certain costs in the uh, arbitration proceedings, right? But you come to think of it, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> when it comes to pure commercial transactions, sales of goods, equity, investment, uh, et cetera, there are a lot of common elements in it, right? So the idea that, um, we can develop a set of uh, common code, right? Uh, and once that set of code are developed, right, uh, by one institution or jointly by several institutions, then it's a matter for the parties whether they would like to, uh, in their contract governing their transaction, to say that, ah, my transaction is to be governed by this um, unified or uniformed uh, commercial uh, code uh, operated in this region, right? which everyone has a set and everyone has a contribution. That would, in my view, massively reduce transaction costs. Uh, and uh, of course, 
uh, in order to achieve that, uh, one needs to uh, have a lot of discussions, uh, debates uh, among top scholars and practitioners in this area. But I'm of the view that uh, with the coming of the Asian century, uh, this is something that uh, should be uh, on the agenda uh, for the wise and the uh, um, uh, good and great, whether in politics or in the professional uh, world, uh, to try to make it happen. In that sense, it will also help to make uh, dispute resolutions uh, under Asian culture uh, move in a smooth, fair, and efficient manner. Uh, I know that my time is uh, coming up. Uh, uh, I thank everyone for uh, listening to my short speech. Uh, and I hope uh, in due course, uh, we can meet each other offline and can discuss uh, more issues uh, which are common to us. And we can promote a great Asian uh, arbitration environment. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you for your presentation and advice. I can imagine that uh, uh, when this uh, issue will be a very difficult task for someone they are looking for an arbitrator. Uh, as you said, it's, it's very tough. Uh, many, many elements have to be considered. Thank you, thank, thank you very much.